Hi, I'm Ruth the Cambridge, the editor in chief of the nonprofit Quarterly, and very glad to welcome you today to uh, this webinar, um, which is called Nonprofit Technology: What Can the Past Teach Us About the Future? Um, I, I, I'm kind of blown away by the quality of panelists that we have today, and so um, I'm, you know, I'm expecting to learn a lot myself. Um, but before we actually start um, talking with the panelists, I want to say that this, this webinar is brought to you free by UST, the Unemployment Services Trust, which helps nonprofits e-file unemployment claims and simplifies HR with the industry's leading web-based platforms. Um, find out how much your organization can save at www.chooseust.org. Um, I also want to um, say to all of our many participants today um, that if you want to tweet out about this session as we're moving along, you can use the hashtag which is on your screen, hashtag NPQ on tech. Um, in terms of any tech problems that you may have, um, if you are having any issues with the audio or video in this webinar, you can use the instructions provided in the email that we sent for the webinar um, to dial in with your telephone instead of, you know, trying to mess around with your computer. Um, the other thing is that we will be taking questions if we can um, at the end of the webinar if we haven't used up all of our time. And so people will see that there is a section on the right hand side of your screen towards the bottom where you can log in your questions. Please feel free to log those in. I'll keep an eye on them as we're moving along and even as I'm asking my questions. If it looks like there's something that pertains to the to what we're talking about, I'll bring it into the conversation. So that said, again, welcome. Um, we're very, very happy to have you here this afternoon. And I'd like to hand this over just for a moment to Karen uh, Graham from Ideal Wear to welcome you on their behalf. They are our partner in this endeavor today. Karen? Thank you, Ruth. Um, I'm, I'm excited that Ideal Wear gets to partner with Nonprofit Quarterly on this and to see so many familiar names on the attendee list and lots of new people too. So welcome everyone. Um, just a little bit about Ideal Wear. We are looking forward to celebrating our 10th birthday next week. And that was part of the reason why we wanted to do um, this webinar with Nonprofit Quarterly on some of the ways that technology has changed in the last decade, um, some of the things that have remained the same, and maybe what we have to look forward to in the next 10 years. And um, so your panelists will be telling you all sorts of things about that, I'm sure. But I'd like to just say that I think the reasons why Idealwear exists um, are still roughly the same today as they were 10 years ago when it was founded. Um, nonprofit organizations, the people who work there, need to have complete information from a reliable, credible source in order to make good decisions about technology, um, whether that's deciding what kind of software they should use or how they should use it. And so that's what we do. If you visit idealware.org, you will find um, free downloadable reports like the Consumer's Guide to Donor Management Systems um, and many other kinds of resources like workbooks and, um, and reports on the landscape of nonprofit technology. You'll also find shorter format articles and blog posts and training that um, is available for just an overview of a topic or an in-depth multi-part course that really gives you in-depth practical information and, and tips about how to use technology well in your organization. So I hope that you'll find that useful and I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so um, again, I'm, I feel very privileged to be moderating this webinar. I, these really, uh, the panelists today are for the leading thinkers 
on uh, the use and potential of technology and its underlying concepts, uh, the application of its underlying concepts in civil society. And that is an important distinction. Um, these four are not technocrats. Um, they are people who really look at technology in a way to understand how it can um, enrich civil society. And so I, I'm sure that as we move along, you'll hear as much about culture, as much about, um, a, about uh, the surroundings of the technology as you will hear about the technology itself. Um, I, it's a first, uh, the, the people that we have with us today, I'll introduce people first, is um, McCray Parker. Hi, McCray. Welcome. Um, and McCray is the Managing Director of Zero Divide, and he's really a specialist in understanding the uses of technology in building community. Um, is there anything else that you would want to say about yourself, McCray, before we get started? Uh-oh. <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> Unmute, McCray. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, just to amplify that, yes, at Zero Divide, we're um, <laughs> uh, primarily focused on the use of technology in underserved and vulnerable communities as a way to address uh, disparities in health, education, workforce development, and economic opportunity. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Beth Cantor, um, uh -huh. who is a well-known blogger, trainer, and connector. Um, she really is seen as being kind of a central node um, in the networks of people working in civil society and trying to figure out the best uses of technology within that. Um, she's also the author of the network nonprofit. Do you want to say anything else about yourself, Beth? Um, I just want to say um, thank you to uh, Laura and to the nonprofit uh, quarterly for inviting me here. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be having this conversation, you know, having the, the chance to kind of look back. It's great to see um, also on the list of attendees some of the, um, I would call them maybe pioneers in our uh, field of MP Tech. So I think we're going to have a great conversation. Perfect. And Amidar, old friend, um, who is the founder and executive director of Idealist, um, which, as everyone knows, is an international network linking people and organizations in civil society. Um, he, he, Idealist has been around since 1996, so Ami is definitely a path um, finder in all of this. Do, is there anything else that you'd like to say about who you are, Ami? Yeah, thank you, Ruth. I, well, I used to have black hair when I started the site, actually, but <laughs> yes, we're getting to our um, 20th anniversary now. And one thing that's great about, you know, having been in this field for 20 years, I think one of my favorite things about technology uh, writ large is how it allows people like Laura and like Beth to um, reinvent themselves completely. So, you know, Beth Cantor, for example, has done many things in her life. The most amazing thing she has done is create this this thing called Beth Cantor, <laughs> which she created from scratch, basically. And she invented this this vessel called Beth Cantor that now holds all. No, I think my parents did. <laughs> no, 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 no. You kind of did one thing, then you did another. You completely recreate yourself from scratch, using all this incredible technology, then become this person that now can be so useful to other people. And, and I think. That's the wonderful thing about tech, that it's created these professions, you know, that didn't exist 20 years ago at all. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blogger trainer, like, what the hell? So <laughs> it's amazing to see these people that have created themselves, and it's hugely satisfying to watch that happening over the years. And Laura, um, who is, you know, one of our partners here, she is at Idealware, and would you want to speak at all about yourself? Why? Sure. So you've heard a lot about Idealware, um, but um, yeah, so I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, Karen and I thought up this topic uh, kind of in celebration of our, of our anniversary. And when I founded Idealware 10 years ago, things were a lot different than they are now. So I'm really excited to talk about what's changed and really what that, put that change into context, what that might mean in terms of what's going to uh, change in the future. Great. Okay, I want to start with a with a very uh, a, a short question. Um, 
in, in your experience, in all of your experience, um, what is the most remarkable thing that you've seen a small nonprofit do with technology? And you can go back as long as you want to, but what, what's one of those moments where you said, aha, that's really fascinating, that opens up a whole new kind of world for me? How about you, Beth? Well, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about it, you know, when uh, McRae was muted and I, you know, put the sign up, you know, unmute uh, like this, I was thinking back to, um, this is really old, um, back uh, to, to where I really got started in, in this industry. Um, it was a project at the New York Foundation for the Arts, and in fact, I see an old colleague, uh, Amy Dugan, hello, uh, who used to work there, and they had this project called Artswire, which was an online network for artists and arts organizations. And, um, and so this was a lot of small, uh, small groups, some large groups. And I remember us experimenting with, we call them the eyeball or the egg cameras. <laughs> I forget what they were called back then. And I remember the first time I saw this, what we have here and we take for granted in Google Hangouts or, or on Skype. When I saw this the first time, um, I was just amazed. Wow. I could talk to somebody <laughs> across the world. And it's like, and it doesn't cost that much really to, um, do this, and it was a um, you know it was a it was a meeting hosted by a small nonprofit, and we had someone from Australia, from the UK, and, and different places in, in the US. And I just remember thinking, wow, this is really this is going to be really big. <laughs> so um, you know, from like 22 years ago or whatever. How about you, Lecrae? Any any thoughts? Sure, I think that uh, when I when I think back um, over my time in this work, um, some of the most um, you know fantastic opportunities and developments for me have happened um, at the intersection of youth and technology, and particularly when thinking about the amplification of youth voice, um, being able to lift that voice, uh, that authentic voice, um, into um, you know spheres of public discourse. Uh, that have uh, implications for systems change and and and, and public policy. Mm. Specifically, I'm thinking of time that I've spent at Youth Radio, where with the advent of uh, more uh, economic means to um, actually have young people, um, you know participate in digital media production and distribute that um, through the internet um, to their peers and to adult allies and to um, folks who probably weren't all as welcoming to um, to their voice and their opinions and, and visions. Um, that has been um, uh, a really fantastic uh, development um, from, from where I sit and I see it uh, just uh, continuing to multiply. Um, as we, we look at movements now that, that take place through Twitter and, and um, digital media production to organize community. Yeah, it's really a profound shift um, in that way. Um, how about you, Ami? I think, well, two things. One, quickly, I was thinking about this group, you know, that got the Landmines Treaty passed. Oh, right. Years ago, that's what got the novel, uh, Jody Powell, what's her name? Right. Um, and there was a tiny group of people, four, five, six people. She was in Vermont, we had to go other places. And just using the phone, using the internet, uh, basic stuff. The fact that six or seven people now um, essentially can talk to anyone anywhere. And that's the thing that I think we, it's interesting, we take it for granted and we don't use it enough. It's like this weird thing at the same time. Like we take for granted that we could sort of talk on video right now with each other. Mm -hmm. And then I still find lots of people who have, you know, two or three offices in the organization and they still use mostly the phone for meetings, like one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm like, don't you want to see each other? Uh, <laughs> I understand why someone wouldn't want to be seen because they want to be doing their email while you're talking to them, but don't want you to see them. <laughs> and, and how come you have phone meetings instead of video meetings where you can actually see someone smiling or nodding, etc. So I think this idea of, on the one hand, taking stuff for granted and actually not using it enough is sort of where we are right now in, in the sector. Right. How about you, Laura? Any thoughts on that? I'm thinking 
think specifically, it's really interesting, kind of interla interlap between my personal and professional, that I was doing just some volunteer work with a, a cultural organization here in Portland, Maine, where I live, and realizing that so they were doing virtually nothing with technology. They're a local group, very much um, a kind of on the ground, uh, spreading the word by word of mouth that they're doing performances and basically being involved with them and saying, hey, you can create your own website using this very inexpensive tool. You can create a broadcast email list. You can ask people to spread the word on Facebook. You can sell tickets online. You can, like, again, all of these technologies that I think certainly all of us panelists and probably almost everybody on the phone just kind of takes for granted exist. But there are many, many, or and this was not very long ago, this was two, three years ago, um, that many, many of us take for granted. And there's still people who are kind of in a, in a gap of information. So I think we're in a really great spot that there is information. Um, and that's maybe a change over since Ideal Wear started. And hopefully we, we feel like we've been part of that change. But even though there is information, I think it's important to try to uh, make sure that people aren't left behind with it. Yeah, you know, Ami, I, I I was just thinking when you were talking that I heard um, the woman who started the landmine effort, Jody. I heard her speak one time, and and she was going on and on about when she put that effort together that the facts was a really life changing <laughs> technology for her, and Whoa. she said she would get up every morning, she would fax everybody about what everybody else was doing. And I think we forget that, you know, the remarkable things that we've learned to do kind of over a period of 30 years and then begin to look at is almost antiquated. <laughs> um, but it is, you know, I just remember so clearly her talking about it, she was really by herself in her apartment um, doing that networking work with people day after day after day. Um, and it, it really is quite astounding. I want to talk to you guys a little bit, and I know that you've all paid attention to this. I think that it, when we talk about this age as an age that somehow um, that's, that, that is informed profoundly by our technological capacities, um, that that the age it, in and of itself is causing changes in our expectations about the pace that we work in and the mm -hmm. potential uh, of what we can do. And I wanted to just um, ask all of you, what do you think are the biggest advances um, that we've seen in the way that nonprofits work that have flowed not only from the technology itself, but from some of the expectations and the cultural changes that we've seen as a result of technology. And maybe we can start with you, McCray. Not to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm thinking that, um, you know, uh, the key for me would be this idea of time and the ability to manipulate time across distance. Um, I think that what the technologies have allowed us <laughs> to do, whether we're talking about fax or email, uh, SMS, uh, you know, uh, text messaging, uh, social media, it allows um, nonprofits to extend their reach um, and a reach that is not bounded by time or geographic location. And so it allows for uh, nonprofits to actually um, leverage and create alliances at light speed um, to then organize themselves around um, particular social impact goals. And so I, I, I think that that's what we're seeing is this fantastic acceleration for um, a nonprofit um, to to actually reach out um, and 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 partner and collaborate and and um, and create um, with with folks globally. And I, I think that's a very exciting um, uh, kind of opportunity for 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 civil work, civil society work. Right. What kinds of changes do you think it causes in the individual participating in that? It's, uh, it's that's one of those issues that I that I've been paying a lot of attention to, just in terms of where we are in the whole kind of global system. What changes does it cause in the individual? Reflecting back on some of my experience with young people, is this idea that with this sort of 
uh, expansion beyond you know time and place um, is a greater sense of global citizenship, um, a way of thinking about yourself um, and your community um, in a in a larger context. Um, I think it creates a particular kind of enlightenment amongst our uh, young people. I think it is something that will serve us well as we you know move into the future and um, try to really get a handle and solve some of um, some of the pressing issues, whether they be climate change or economic opportunity or clean water, um, this idea that um, young people are through through the technology, through their participation in these in these networks, um, gaining a, a greater sense of what it means to be a global a global citizen. Yeah. How about you, Beth? <laughs> you know, I was just sitting here nodding. How can you follow uh, that. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, nodding my head in agreement, and, and certainly I wrote a lot about this in my first book, the, the Network Nonprofit, and you know the ability to connect with um, people and other organizational networks that share our values and our passion about a particular issue and have the crowd move or create movements or groundswells um, towards it. But I'm also at you know as I look towards writing my third book, the Happy Healthy Nonprofit, uh, I look at sort of the flip side of this, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. There, it's it's fantastic. There's a lot of potential, um, but you know, there are you know challenges and consequences. Now that we have uh, you know these technologies in our lives, and we've adopted digital lifestyles um, and digital work styles, you know, and there's a scale of that, as Ami has said, um, and even digital society, you know, where we turn and we see, you know, go look in a, on the subway, how many people are staring at their phones, you know. Uh, versus talking to each other. So I think, you know, and, and what's underneath of this, if we just think about like um, the 21st century, <laughs> and we think about the Industrial Revolution, and we think about, um, you know, the rise of the modern offices and cubicles, and here we're all sitting at our desks, you know, staring. And then, you know, and, and, and so we've shifted from this kind of culture of moving around to like a culture of sitting, which is really unhealthy. Um, and, and deadly in some cases, both to our body and also our mind. And then we have the, the internet over the last few years, which is impacting those young people. You know, it used to be, let's go out and play and have imagination, but now let's go down in the basement and play video games. And if you look at this young generation, younger generation, and the amount of time they're spending online compared to other generations, you know, I really think that um, we need to learn how to balance and uh, live with this technology so it, it doesn't become this dark cloud, this toxic dark cloud. So that's what I'm really, really interested in. And I mean, and there's also a piece underneath of it when you put um, people like us who work for social causes, you know, who are passionate, and we add the technology, and we're passionate about this. Um, we forget about self-care, <laughs> and we forget that we need to put the oxygen mask on ourselves before we uh, start to take care of it and encourage others. So I'd like to put a word in for um, healthy tech. <laughs> so Ami, what, what advances, what are, what are the major advances that have flowed not just from the technology? Um, but also from what surrounds it in terms of a culture. What are the major advances? Yeah, in, the, in, the in our work. Yeah, I think, well, again, you know, it's so interesting. I think on the one hand, you have all these things that have changed that we take for granted. So we email each other, we all have little websites, we're on Facebook. At the same time, I think it's sort of fascinating to, to think about how much has not changed. You know, how if you just show up, for you know the independent sector conference, for example, and you remember that conference 20 years ago, it's sort of astonishing sometimes how it's sort of the same actually in the end, um, and how how we actually haven't um, really gone and changed. And, and I think you know there's this there's this Canadian American uh, science fiction writer called William Gibson who says that the future is already here; it's only unevenly distributed. And I think our sector is sort of extreme in that. And that you have people who you know would not consider going to a conference that is not based on an open conference, unconference format, and then you have a ton of people that have never heard of those formats. You have people who would not consider talking to someone without seeing them, and you have people today who don't know that that is possible for free. I meet people now who have never heard of Skype. It's sort of amazing, but it's true, um, and so. You have this incredibly uneven 
And so, you know, I was thinking about the title of this panel, you know, the trends in the sector. I think one of those places where the trends, most trends are here, easy to predict in that, there'll just be more people in the sector doing what some have done already. Now, is that a, is that a good thing? I don't know, picking up on some of that stuff, you know, so quickly, I think some of the advantages are pretty obvious. I think there are a couple of sort of, you know, big things I think to worry about. One is our power to concentrate, the amounts of time that we get interrupted every day right now. You mentioned faxing earlier. And I remember, you know, I'm old enough that when I started working, I was in a fax-based environment. And there was something so civilized about coming in the morning, finding a pile of faxes from, from overseas overnight, <laughs> spending an hour uh, answering those faxes, and then those people would take 24 hours to get back to you, and then you would spend your next morning getting back to them. And there's something when you think about it deeply, I'm not sure that we actually collectively achieve more by getting back to each other in 10 minutes that we achieve by having a 24-hour cycle. Uh, it's not actually clear at all that we're actually achieving more. Uh, there's this interesting uh, writer, um, uh, Gopnik, in the New Yorker, who's also, I think, almost 60 now. And so he remembers himself as a journalist typing and then, you know, word processing. And he remembers, he knows, that he has not become more productive on his computer than he was on his typewriter. And his writing is certainly not better. You know, the fact that we have computers right now, does that mean that people are writing better than Mark Twain or Melville or Tolstoy? Clearly not. So, so interruptions, quality of the work, um, and then one, I think, big one, which is, which is political, and that I think about um, a lot, which is, you know, before this kind of technology, when something big happened, if you remember, like, the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf, and we all got angry about something, we, 20, 30, 100 years ago, we would have to come out and go to the town square to find other people that were also angry, and then we might actually do something with them. We'd actually go over to the nearest BP gas station and complain. Now, it's so easy to let off steam on Twitter or Facebook that people literally just let off steam, and, and very few people would actually go out and meet other people and do something because you've expressed your anger. And I think someone like BP is very happy with a million people tweeting as opposed to 100,000 people showing up in their gas station and saying, come on, stop this. So, that's, so, so I think there's so many advantages, uh, but I think we also have to learn how to live with this. Sorry for the last point here. The scheduling bit, uh, we just hired a woman here who used to be a, a lawyer in New York at a big law firm, and she told me that over the last five years, every night she slept with her Blackberry on her chest in case her partner had to call her at night, her law partner, her boss. And so you'd spend your life sleeping with your Blackberry in case it vibrates at 3 a.m. because they need you in Hong Kong. And that's not a life. And, and I think that we're still in this place where we're learning how to live with this. Um, and I think you're going to see interesting that the Volkswagen, I think, now in Germany is experimenting with a perk for workers of saying, if you're mid-management, after 6 a.m., 6 p.m. every night and on weekends, the server will shut down. You guys can't email each other even if you want to. And I think that as people compete for talented employees across different sectors, that promise of your weekend will be yours again, no matter what, because we're literally going to shut down the mail server, that could be an incredible recruitment technique if you think about it. So anyway, there's still, I think we're still in the middle of, of learning how to deal with these, with these things. Where do you put them during a date? Where do you put them during dinner? How does this work? Anyway, sorry for that long, there's a lot to learn still. My strategy is simply to leave my phone places and leave my iPad places. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm yeah, cut off. I one. can't do anything about it. That's that. <laughs> off the grid. Um, how about you, um, Laura? How do you, what what do you what comes to your mind? Yeah, I was reflecting on what McCrae was saying um, in regard to the idea of kind of emphasizing the voices so more people can uh, kind of say what they say and actually to kind of take that to a different place. I think there's been a huge democratization, and not evenly as Ami was saying, but a democratization of the use of technology which expands to nonprofits. I think 10 or 15 or 20 years ago you really probably did need kind of a techie 
to help you use technology. I think that it's certainly not like there is no role for a very technology-minded person now, but I think it is, it's reasonable to think that you as an individual or you as an organization without a techie can actually get pretty far. So the idea of like looking at the trend of, of you know, 10 years ago you needed a professional website person to update a website. You needed someone to manage your server if you were going to do anything um, substantial. And these days, you really, in some cases, you do. But in a lot of cases, you know, with cloud-based tools, with things getting more and more kind of self-service, like website builders, you can really do a lot as an individual or an organization. And that really creates a lot of power. Um, and in like a um, resource-strapped environment like the nonprofit space, it's also I think it's kind of it's kind of liberating to realize that all right, I don't don't need to wait until I've got fifty thousand dollars to hire an IT person to really do stuff. That I can do stuff with a thousand dollars and a little bit of scrappiness, and it can be real and transformational uses of technology. Yeah, I want to push um, you guys a little bit. Um, because I think it, just in terms of, of, of how organizations themselves work, um, nonprofit organizations, have you seen any serious changes to the way organizations work as a result of technology, the way they interact, not on a, on a very functional level, but on a more, you know, on, on a level that is more at, at the level of, assumption um, and and um, ex really expanded purview can um, how about you Beth <laughs> yeah I was that trying works. to uh, suss out what you meant by um, purview because uh, you know I mean I I, th I think uh, the, the cha uh, like 20 years ago when we called ourselves circuit riders remember um, when there weren't any IT people, because I was thinking about what Laura was saying, you know, when there wasn't a, a, an NTEM, when there wasn't a field of nonprofit technologists, and there was this small group of us who were the, the techies, were, you know, funded by, by maybe a foundation um, to service a lot of nonprofits, and, and, and we were kind of the bridge, you know, in those days, you know, <laughs> you needed someone to come in and show you how to, you know, hook up the modem and what the modem switches were and, you know, or how to code, you know, it wasn't all hidden from you. And, and, so, and so now a lot of that's become a lot plug and play, it's become a lot easier, and, and maybe uh, organizations are kind of bringing in specific experts on different topics when they need to go in deeper, like, you know, I mean, Laura, I remember like 10 years ago when we did the first webinar on Google Ads or something, and it was yeah, simpler, but like now if you want to do Google Ads, you kind of really need to hire a specialist instead of having a generalist. Um, and, and so it's become more, um, you know, there's this baseline that's there, and they're able to work with that. And what I'm seeing is more in the, less of the technical stuff, but more of the human stuff. Uh, and, I'm, I'll, and in my area, like, for example, um, like meetings, online collaboration, uh, you know, there's some sort of just getting to use the tools, but not really taking it to a deep level in terms of the art of virtual collaboration and, and how that's done. I see a lot of pain points between, I hear a lot about, oh, gee, we have remote offices and we're, doing, we're trying to do the video and stuff, but we're interrupting each other all the time or, you know, or the meetings are taking three hours and we're not getting anything done. So kind of like the art of um, the art of using the tools together, as opposed to have what buttons to push. You know, it's evolving. There's some there's some bright spots and some great um, organizations that are doing great work, but I hear it as a, a source of pain in, in a number of organizations. I don't know if that gets to your question. It does. Uh, uh, how about you, Ami? About organizations working with each other, you're saying? Well, no, just about, you know, has it changed the way organizations work? Um, so has it changed their relationships, for instance, with their boards, <laughs> with their staff? I have, to, I, have to say one, I have to say one thing. 22 years ago, we had a saying at Artswire, because we did online meetings, and we said, if your board is dysfunctional offline, it's going to be dysfunctional online. The technology is not going to change it. And I think some, in some respects, that holds true. Sorry, I, I just... It brought up a memory. <laughs> well, on, on that, you know, on, on that note, I was smiling because uh, there was a woman here last year who was writing a book about nonprofit boards or something, 
and she came to talk to me and she asked me, you know, what's the biggest change I've seen uh, in the sector with this whole technology thing, especially social media and stuff. And I thought for a moment, and, I, and you know, I'm sorry, the first thing that came to my, to my mind was that the biggest change I've seen with technology is that it's made annoying people more annoying. <laughs> people, who are, people who were annoying before have really good tools to be even more annoying now uh, in your face. You know, the, the, the annoying self-promoter can now become a monster, basically. So that's, I think, the, the, the biggest change I've seen, honestly. Um, all this stuff, we no, I mean, seriously now, you know, we, we, again, we, we take so much stuff for granted. It's getting harder, you know, you meet older people, younger people, it's getting harder to get uh, younger people to imagine a webless world. You know, there was once a world where your mom couldn't find you. That actually um, existed. And it's harder to imagine what that was like, which for people you know, our age, that's how we grew up. You, you, you would arrive at a hotel and ask if there were faxes for you. You'd get off the airplane in the airport and go find a public phone and put a porter in to call the office to see if anything happened while you were on the flight. And like, we, we take for granted that that world is all gone for, for most of us. I think the question is, which is a really interesting question, are we actually more productive? I mean, it's, it's really interesting. If you, if you take a certain kind of organization, now I don't want to you know, think, and actually almost like deliberately made them work with, with older tech, where they get to interrupt each other less, may produce, I don't know. It, it'd be interesting to see what, what happened. There's this awesome you know, biography of, of Robert Moses by uh, Robert Caro, and there's this description of him in the 1920s uh, handling mail with his secretaries, M-A-I-L. And he's sitting in front of them. He's got this big pile of mail. He's got three secretaries in front of him. And he basically, they're well trained. So he, uh, he is in front of the secretary. He's got this pile of mail. And he just flings the mail at all, all three of them. He says, tell him yes, tell him no. Tell him to screw himself. Yes, no, screw himself. That's a quote from the book. Uh, and the secretaries know how to take a no or a yes and fashion an amazing typewritten letter that will go to that person. And all he has to do is yes, no, yes, no. He doesn't spend his day in front of a computer. So anyway, I'm not sure that we still completely understand how to work with all this. I'm not sure the changes are all great. I don't know. I think we're all still learning. That's what I feel. I think things have not stabilized yet, and I don't know when they will. We're still, all of us, learning how to work with this. How about you, Laura? So ways that technology has really kind of transformed. So obviously, so technology isn't a silver bullet. So thing, people are people, and relationships are relationships, and it can't. I think actually one of the things to keep in mind, just kind of uh, going off of what Ami was saying, is that it won't. So it never replaces. Uh, it basically only adds as opposed to replace anything. So phone calls will always be important. Well, so at least conference calls will always be important. Face-to-face -face meetings will always be important. Um, and so you're not going to replace a culture, and you certainly shouldn't try to replace a culture of actual human interaction uh, with um, this kind of mediated interaction. But that being said, there are whole nonprofits who are who never would have or could have existed. Uh, you know, there's whole, for instance, organizations that are basically based on internet advocacy and outreach, right. um, which are products of internet and social media, and they do amazing work to get people engaged and energized and, and all of that stuff. So I feel like it's, the, it, as everybody's saying, it's a, it's it's an amazing tool. Technology is an amazing tool that can be used for these really amazing things. But we need to keep away from assuming that somehow everything will be different once we use technology. Because, yeah, annoying people will still be annoying, and a dysfunctional board will still be dysfunctional. Well, how about, I, I want to talk a minute about what you, what you just said, which is the idea of these outside-in organizations the organizations that are built on the assumption that they are going to be fueled and directed by the outside, that they're not going to become more insular, that they're going to keep reaching out and trying to understand how to organize their work around the expectations of a fairly large community. To me, that's a very major um, 
advance that, that we see as a result of technology. It's a completely different kind of organization. It's built on some ideas in civil society, but it is a very different type of organization. And um, so I want to just pick up on some of those kind of really, you know, those models, those new models that we see out there. For instance, even with organizations that are not built that way, we've seen some pretty astounding um, examples of organizations who are actually taken over by their stakeholders. Um, when their board violates what they think the board should be doing or the decisions that the, that people feel like the board should be making. There's, you know, the Sweetbriar College and, and, um, and uh, San Diego Opera, but where, where stakeholders of the organization actually revolt and say that's not governance in our eyes. Um, so, you know, to me this represents kind of a major advance, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about that kind of fairly broad outside-in influence that technology has allowed us to have. And maybe we can go to you, McCray, because I know you work in this kind of conceptual space a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think in the uh, any number of organizations that we've done uh, tech adoption integration with, you know, one of the things that surfaces uh, for those organizations, particularly those that are doing advocacy, kind of civic engagement um, work, is a desire to have an ability to um, bring the outside in um, through um, very immediate and accurate feedback. Um, this idea of how do we go about um, polling constituents, how do we go about um, aggregating data uh, around what constituents feel need to happen in community. Right. I mean, throughout um, California, we work with the uh, uh, California Endowment on the Building Health uh, building Healthy Communities Initiative, and um, a, a, a large uh, part of that work is around creating a kind of uh, capacity, a technology capacity amongst um, uh, community organizers to do just that, to, to be able to communicate more effectively with their constituents, um, to be able to receive the feedback, to be able to ag aggregate data and actually do an analysis that then talks about the formulation of uh, a, a particular piece of policy or a 10-point plan or just go up at City Hall um, to talk to our representative. Um, so I think it, it, it has become a very powerful um, force in, in, in community work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, moving from there to the idea of building movement um, and the uses of technology in building movement, which is really kind of a central, you know, it's, it's like a central function of civil society that we build movements to get things done, right? Um, there's been some kind of remarkable advances, you know, with the Occupy, with the Black Lives Movement. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, you know, what we've seen that have been just really earth shattering kind of um, moments um, in, in our recent history that, that are just enormously exciting and portends something strong for the future. And can we start with you, McCray? Well, I, I think, in, you know, in, in recent years here, I think I was, um, you know, really um, struck by um, some of the work that happened with Black Lives Matter, um, particularly around the incidents in Ferguson. The way in which, um, you know, the, the propagation of message and action um, went national, went to scale um, very quickly, um, that you could have uh, simultaneous movements, I mean people showing up on the steps of City Hall um, to um, really uh, vent some of that anger you're referring to Amy, about um, the, um, the, the policies um, aimed at um, um, you know, um, folks of color and, and specifically African American uh, men and boys. And so um, I think that that um, advancement in um, building movement building work and and advocacy work um, has really now uh, you know uh, um, you know really lifted um, that work up to the, the level of, of national discourse as you know um, you know Bernie Sanders Clinton um, you know 
you know, were convened um, to actually talk about um, positions specifically around that. And I think that that comes through the aggregate aggregation of that of that movement um, to to give them voice at that that stage. And um, looking forward to um, the continued development of that of that yeah. work. Anybody else want to talk about that at all? I I could a little bit. Um, from a different perspective um, and more in kind of um, some of these really self-organized, uh, I don't want to use the word, but viral fundraising campaigns, um, the ALS Ice Bucket uh, Challenge, of course, which we know uh, the most and is the most dramatic example of that. And then there's another one that just happened in the UK, Stephen's story, that uh, was the Teenage Cancer Trust. And it was a, a young guy with brain cancer who, who had a highly connected network and um, and kind of transparently shared his bucket list. And, um, and on his bucket list was, I want to raise, you know, a million pounds for the Teenage Cancer Trust. And his community rallied behind it and basically kind of went, it, this, uh, went beyond the million dollars. They raised five million pounds, I believe. Um, and of course, he passed. And there was sort of this uh, crowd-based mourning that happened. Um, and then even smaller examples, um, it's not just these big ones. I'm thinking of this uh, campaign that happened recently over the summer to support the Syrian refugees. It was called Buy Pens. And what happened is that um, there was a, um, an individual, uh, a, a human rights activist from Finland, who was covering conflict areas, and he tweeted a photo of this man um, a refugee carrying his daughter over his shoulder uh, um, with, a, with a, a fistful of, you know, pens, trying to sell pens to make a living. And all of um, his Twitter followers were saying, who is this guy? We want to help him. We want to buy some of his pens. And he said, no, I, I, I don't know who he is. Maybe some people in my network do. And so someone who was following on Twitter said, yeah, I know who he is, he, and I, we can get his WhatsApp number. So they got his WhatsApp number, and all of his followers were all like, let's do a crowdfunding campaign for him. He says, no, 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 we have to find a nonprofit. So they found um, a, uh, a woman who had a small NGO called uh, Lebanon for Refugees who could accept the money. Uh, they set up a crowdfunding campaign. They thought, oh, they'll raise $1,000, and they'll help this guy you know, get an apartment or whatever. They raised $5,000 in a half hour, and of course the, the media got a hold of it, and then um, within a week they would raised almost $200,000 that they were then able to help many more refugees. So, and all of this comes down to this idea, and I think Lee Rainey of the Pew Internet in American Life has talked about it. It's called networked individualism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in the old days before the Internet, um, all of us maybe remember that, uh, our networks were people we knew face-to-face. -face. They were called close ties. They were our families, our churches, our, our villages. And because of the Internet, we're able to make these, have these far-flung, looser networks of people that are interested. And so this can cause, um, so, you know, what, what Craig was talking about, you know, and especially in civil society, you know, movements of people uh, wanting uh, social change. It can also help people rallying to, you know, help people <laughs> that may have been helped by institutions in the past. Right. Uh, just after that, quickly, um, is that I think we, we just heard, I think, about the, the whole, like, almost possible range of what's happening here. On one side, you have something like Black Lives Matter that is really essentially based on a decentralized hashtag. So, you know, there's a couple of, you know, African-American women who are creative, they came up with this hashtag that took on its own power and you have, you know, there's no headquarters. You, you can't send them a FedEx package, the Black Lives Matter people. It's all over the place. And um, it, it rises. It's interesting. You've seen these graphs where you can follow the hashtag over time. And it's amazing how that one hashtag over the year can rise and fall based on what's happening. It gets reused again in really interesting ways. And it's become, it's, it's, you can build a whole movement that is so completely decentralized around that one thing and that it affects millions and millions of people. At the other extreme, you have sort of a case that Beth mentioned, or also those of you that follow um, this blog and Facebook page, Humans of New York, where this guy has, you know, 50 million fans, and one day he meets a kid, and that kid moves in, so he meets his teacher, and he raises a million bucks or more for the, for the school. And I think to just keep in mind that, that, that in, in some way, both of those are beautiful. I sort of prefer the first one, if you like, in that the second one, can be almost dangerous in that that teacher, that, that guy with his pens, um, that kid, that school, they benefited 
But in New York, there are a million kids. There are thousands of schools that need help. And sometimes by, by having this kind of like very hyped crowdsource campaign where that kid, and that kid, you know, these days is almost like an arc that's predictable. That kid ended up in the White House, of course, and we, we got him to the White House. And that gives us a sense, all of us, that we did something about education in New York. No, we didn't. We helped one kid and we helped one school. But, education in but New the, York, bypass, the money was used for um, many other refugees. Not just for that one. Yeah, but, but, but I'm saying is, is 200,000 bet is not, you know, UN needs billions. More, I, yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I think sometimes you have this sense of, of like, the, the whole community gathering on an individual who, in an almost accidental way, became hyped or famous, and distracts us from the bigger problem sometimes. So I think my, so, so I'm, I'm more, sort of, I favor things like Black Lives Matter that are basically widely spread as opposed to this focus that we all have, the ability that we have now, right now, millions of people, to focus on one person, either to be all angry at them or to help them. Uh, I don't know how a human ego, by the way, can handle this also new thing of having 10, 20, 30 million people all being angry with you at the same time. <laughs> how does one person deal with that? Uh, that's another sort of interesting innovation. Anyway. Um, I think that there's something really a kind of both good and bad about almost this idea of like viral out, viral outrage or viral excitement. Like viral is a word that we, I think like five or six years ago was being used a lot for videos. Like everybody wants to make a viral video. Um, and then it kind of, it, it lost a lot of the shine because it's really difficult. And I think this idea of viral outrage or viral excitement is kind of it's, it's interesting in the same way when it's really hard to harness in, like, as an organization to say, we're going to do this. We're going to do Ice yeah. Bucket. We're going to get everybody right. talking about our campaign. And it also, and it, it can be enormously powerful, like in Black Lives Matter, and just take off. I, and when you have something that causes such legitimate outrage, the idea that the outrage can be vir viral it becomes really important. But I think you've also got things that cause illegitimate outrage, like you've got the idea of things that simply aren't true that go viral, or you've got kind of, you know, probably not super important excitement, as Ami is saying. And so, like, basically you have the magnification of kind of a miscellaneous set of ideas at times, some portion of which are enormously important, but I think that there is... It's not, to my mind, it's, I wish that it would, could be rationalized a little bit to say, all right, like, only things like Black Lives yeah. Matter would generate such excitement and outrage and Instead not of, kind of a bunch of miscellaneous things. You know, it's sort of like, is the dress blue, white, or gold? <laughs> right. Yeah. But <laughs> if we consider that we're kind of playing out the pieces of our interests online, some of them are very personal and some of them are collective. It does, it's not really that surprising. And no. it, it seems to me that we're seeking out a set of norms um, that will become more and more use, will become more and more used to as the technology develops. We'll understand how ethically, how morally, how in other ways, emotionally, we want to manage our, our our interaction with it. Um, I want to, um, by the way, Ami, somebody on the questions uh, thing over here is in love with you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, whoever oh, it is is a big fan. <laughs> I, got, I got scared. I thought you were going to say something bad. By the way, just say, uh, how much money no. do you have? <laughs> I want to just give um, you each a very quick chance to say something in one sentence. Um, watch out for. Um, this is important for you to keep an eye on to all of the people who are participating in this today. Oh, here, somebody's saying we all love Ami, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. I love you all back um, without, knowing, without knowing who you are. I'll just take that. Thank you. I'll uh, kick off the question by actually saying I, 
And thinking about this, there's actually one thing that I want to make sure that people don't look out for um, too carefully, which is that I think that everybody is really afraid of the pace of technology, that technology changes so fast I can't keep up, and that scares people away from doing things. I would say that in just reflecting on our 10 years, one of the things we found is that technology, like yearly trends, if you look back at trends over like a year, they're not massive. Like trends over 10 years, those are massive. Um, but don't look out so carefully for what the trend is, what the latest thing is, is that you don't do things. Because I think really technology changes over you know, 18 months, two years. You need to recheck in and make sure you yeah. know what's going on. But not over the There's a lot of dead ends and, and immediate fads out there that are not, not worth wasting your time on. How about you, McCray? You know, I, I think at, at Zero Divide we see the, you know, um, continued development and growth opportunities um, for technology to really um, serve underserved communities, vulnerable populations. Um, and in particular, um, we think um, a particular focus should be placed um, around health equity um, in those communities. And we see um, technology, whether we're talking about mobile, whether we're talking about um, the development of uh, database systems, mapping systems, um, you know, uh, really having major implications for how to um, close the gap there in terms of, of health, health in, in underserved communities. Ami? Don't disappoint your fans. <laughs> oh, so, raise the expectations. Uh, two, two, two good things. One is uh, just make everyone that you can aware of all the free stuff that's available. I know, again, um, it, it pains me so much to see people paying for stuff that's free. You know, we as an organization have now a staff of 50. We haven't paid for email hosting, I think, in six or seven years. I mean, Google does it. Why should we pay for it? Uh, we don't buy, you know, software. We just use Google Docs, and it's fine. Um, we use Salesforce, and those are, you know, ten of those are free. Uh, you use Skype, and that's free. I mean, there is so much. Once you pay for your internet connection, there is so much that is free. Something we we know, something we don't know. I learned something only a few years ago. I had no idea that if you go to YouTube, in addition to you know cats and stuff and whatever, you can find a class about anything, there's anything in the world that you want to learn, you type it in into YouTube, you'll learn how to use Skype. You enter that in YouTube and you'll get a lesson on how to use Skype. So it's all, it's all there and it's free, that's one thing. And second thing I think shorter to sort of watch for, not watch for, is to don't do anything just because other people are doing it. So in other words, other people are hiring a social media manager, so we need one too. I don't know, do you? Other people are free. You know, the, the, the single most depressing site, I think, in the web right now is the person that you go to a Twitter account and you see that that person has eight followers, but she has tweeted 20,000 times. <laughs> Who is she tweeting for? Who is this nonprofit tweeting for with 420 followers and they've hired a social media manager? Go in the street and give out leaflets and you'll reach many more people. So don't do anything because other people are doing it and use free stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, I get excited and or annoyed. So. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I like the little things we get about how to be a thought leader. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> Made me think. Um, Beth? Uh, yes, and, and I just want to add to, to Ami's, you know, uh, use the free stuff, but make sure it's not free like as in puppies. And I think Deborah Finn, our colleague who's here, is always fond of saying that, meaning the cost of a free computer. If you remember back then, you get the, the thing that the corporation was dumping and it didn't work. Um, so um, I would um, say actually uh, a couple of things. I would uh, echo Ami um, in, you know, taking incremental steps. You know, it doesn't have to be sexy. It doesn't have to be the me too. Uh, technology or technique that everybody else is doing, but you know, take that first smart, incremental, practical step. And of course, Laura over the 10 years has been so great at providing um, great reports and um, and summarizing all the knowledge that's in the field to help organizations uh, take that first 
first step. And I, 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 I remember actually that first email that you sent out to the writers list, you know, talking about, I want to do a report, like, and I thought it was great. And then the other thing I think that is most important in this age um, is that, you know, as we get to be, <laughs> have the gray hair, <laughs> we tend to get set in our ways and we'd like to do the same thing because um, because we've uh, created those neurons in our brains and it's just comfortable and it's easy. We don't have to think. There's not cognitive overload um, because we've always done this. It's like a comfortable sweater. Um, so I want to like put a shout out to, you know, keeping agile in terms of your load learning and adapt, you know, and not getting stale. You know, if there is something, a, a new technology, uh, maybe take that first incremental step with a small experiment and see if it is something that, that will work for you. So uh, agile learning, take incremental steps, and you don't do it just because everyone else is doing it and it's sexy. Thank you, and this has been really wonderful. I do want to say something about the way the conversation has gone, and uh, it, I just think it's so important to recognize that as much as you've talked about the possibilities and the potential, of technology, you guys have also talked about the downside. And I do think there's this contradiction that works itself out in any situation. It's what, what do you call it? Dialectics. Um, that, that there's always, a, you know, one side wrestling with another, the, 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 you know, the positive side of something wrestling with the more negative side. And if we don't push ourselves to see both sides of our advancements in technology and civil society, we're going to miss something, a downside of something that will be absolutely disastrous to some community, um, or the upside of something that is a, a terrible opportunity missed. It is really important to kind of keep track of the criticisms as well as the lauding of things. And I think in, in a way that's what you guys have been talking about, that that you know, this is an area that you really have to kind of stay on your toes um, and keep your eye out for, you know, for what's, what the technology is doing to us for good and for bad. Thank you so much to Idealware for co-sponsoring this um, and for all of the panelists. I hope we can do this again sometime. I do see something here. Um, from, there were a lot of questions about software and hardware that I stayed away from. Um, I think it's probably at some point we want to try to do some things that address those issues. But also, you know, um, I think people were very excited about the level of the conversation today. So thank you very much for all of your participation. And thanks on behalf of Idealware, um, we're, this was great to host. Thank you so much to our panelists. And just to mention, if you're interested in this kind of high-level discussion of kind of what's changed, definitely check out on the Idealware website. We've got two more upcoming panels, one on the kind of the past and the future, what we can learn from the past for the future on digital fundraising, which is on the 19th. Um, November and one on the what we can learn from the past in terms of data and results data on the 3rd of December. So we hope to see you there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you Ruth. Huh? <laughs> thank you, Ruth. Yes, uh, thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Bye. Yes. Bye, guys.